junior senior year and then the two years after school like i was out of i was out of the country eight months a year bopping around the world with a camera in hand not making money that i could sit here and brag to you about but it's like who cares about the money i'm getting paid to go to the coolest places on the planet like there's so many kids that are trying to get into this content creation world that i meet with all the time and they're always like hey how much do you charge how do you charge and i'm like hey look i'll tell you and i'll be super honest with you like if you come take my client heck yeah good for you it means you're doing better work than me that's capitalism like that's awesome and i'm <laughs> I love super that attitude man that's nuts yeah, yeah but i'm super honest yeah. with him because like nobody was ever honest with me getting into this i just had to stumble forward but i'm like if if money is your goal this isn't necessarily the best industry to be in but if you want experience and to meet really amazing people and then build opportunity from there that's the best way to do it What's up, everybody, and welcome to The Creative Brief. Today, I've got a great conversation with my good buddy, Knox Cronenberg, an adventure photographer and storyteller from Austin, Texas. Now, Knox has worked with all the big outdoor brands you love and is about to take his art to the next level with some of the most insane photography you have ever seen. This episode is a blast, and I am excited you're here for it. I'm Brian Athey, and this is The Creative Brief. All right, we're going to let it rip. What's up, Noxy? How are you, bud? Dude, better than I deserve. Blessed to be here. Blessed to be talking to you. I still remember the first time that I met you, and I think you said the exact same thing. You said, like, <laughs> better than I deserve. Blessed to be here. I don't know if it's a life motto or something I live by, but I feel like there's a lot of unhappy people in the world, and my goal is to just be the happiest person in every room. Sometimes I fail, but most of the time I can... I can usually strike up some energy. It's the goal. I'm so excited you're on, man. Thank you for for taking the time between all the adventures uh, to to come by the podcast and say what's up. I've been wanting to have you on for a long time because I am like I'm obsessed with your photography and everything that you do. But like I said before, I'm just like I'm kind of addicted to the energy. So every time you're <laughs> around, like I just feel better. Um, and so thanks for thanks for gracing this, man. I'm I'm super excited. Hell yeah, man. I'm happy to be here. I, you're crushing it. I'm so stoked to see you on this new endeavor and be a part of it and hopefully be helpful in any kind of way I can. I mean, it's 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 awesome to see where it's started and where it's where it's going. And uh, just glad to be here. I think this is like 14 episodes in, which means 14 weeks. And like I was telling you before, like I've recorded a couple that can't go up and right. I, skipped, I skipped a week. Uh, but every week I kind of learn something different and, and it gets it gets bigger and better and, and people reach out and uh, it's been, it's been such a blessing, man. Like I've really, really enjoyed the experience and getting to just getting to talk to people, you know? What a, yeah, totally. I mean, what a cool way to, to, to create and do unique things and talk to unique people. I mean, I feel like this platform is such a unique way to, uh, to get more out of people and kind of dive deep and, with intention, but also kind of be able to share that with a broader audience. You know, yeah. you're, you're having conversations with people that, most people never get to converse with and, and you're getting to share it with a platform. So that's super cool. Well, you do it in a very different way. And I want you to, I want you to set us up a little bit with, um, I guess, I, I don't know a hundred percent what you do. I know, like, I know like the, the world that you live in and I know, like, I know, I don't, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't know how to put a job title on it because I'll talk to you some weeks and you're like on top of a mountain and then I'll talk to you some weeks and you're out in the desert and then I'll talk to you some weeks and you're out on some like fly fishing adventure. But how did all this start, man? How did you become uh, an, a lifestyle adventure photographer? Or is that even what you call it? Like, tell, tell me, tell me what you do. How do you, how do you put yourself into an elevator pitch? The best way to, to explain where I've got is, or how I've gotten here is my life has just been a natural progression of passion. Is, yeah. is kind of the simplest way to explain it. I'm incredibly blessed and lucky to be born not only in America, but in Austin in this geographically blowing up city. Um, yeah. So there's all kinds of unique individuals here that I get to connect with. And for me being in the outdoor industry, like Yeti kind of started this movement in Austin that has brought thousands and thousands of jobs, but also brands and all these so, other unique opportunities here for me to be able to work within and around. So I think you got to go back to set me up like when you were in school, like in high school, you were, totally. you were a student, but you were also like, you were already into the chasing these passions when you were a kid, right? Yeah. So, so kind of the outdoor, I was introduced to the outdoors by my dad. And mm -hmm. when I was really young, I fell in love with the idea of being outside. Like video games were never a part of my life. 
staying inside was never a part of my life. It was like, how can I maximize time outside? From sunup to sundown, it was like, I wanted to be outside. And that kind of evolved into, I love bass fishing. Like in high school, it was, I'm going to be the world's best bass fisherman. And we started the bass fishing team for our high school. And a buddy of mine went and fished in the state tournament. You we started got, the team? Is that right? Yeah we, yeah, we started it for our high school here in Austin. Every time and, I've ever told anybody about you, I was like, he was he was on the fishing team in high school. I think that's right. And they're like, can't be. There's no such thing as a fishing team. Like you well, started it. So we started the high school bass fishing team, which is mm -hmm. all conventional fishing. And it was awesome. And we got second in state, lost by two ounces. And that summer going into my, I guess my sophomore year, I kind of got bit by this fly fishing bug. And then that, when that fly fishing bug bit me, it was like, that's it. Yeah. That's it. It was my, my drugs, my, it was, alcohol, it was the wake my up moment. Yeah. 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 And it was, I have this really severe problem in life to where I either give you 150% or zero and mm -hmm. school pretty much got zero throughout my, my yeah. career. Um, but fly fishing at that point was taking every ounce of time, energy and brain capacity I had. And there's a, a, a really good buddy of mine who was four years older than me in school. His name's Noah Thompson, who kind of led me and showed me a really unique path within this fly fishing world and opened some really awesome doors for me and, uh, introduced me to some really cool people that basically it allowed me to go compete on the U S youth fly fishing team, which was the door opener of all door openers for me. Um, so, so you got getting, to travel the world. Yeah. Getting to see parts of the world that I never thought I'd get to see going and doing TV shows with people I never got to thought I'd get to do. And, and that, you're, you're 15, 16, 17, 18, like you're high school age. Totally. Yeah. Literally yeah. in high school, all my buddies are, you know, going to school every day and I'm trying to figure out how to ditch school and go fishing and then Unreal. learn all these, because the, the interesting thing about the U S team is it's all trout fishing and there's not really trout fishing in Texas. Like you have the Guadalupe river, which is all stocked fish. So it's not a technical fishery. So I'd have to fly to these locations to learn and get to educated on how to fish, how to read the water, how to do all these things. Um, and that was kind of like my first exposure into this outdoor industry, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I guess to backtrack a few steps at this time. And then also in middle school, I actually worked for Yeti, which has kind of become a calling card that helps open doors for me. Well, I was Yeti's first ever intern. Like when they, the whole company was, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah, was like, back when it was just like the two guys out in, in uh are they in dripping or they're in dr where are they? So they started in, in Driftwood, but Driftwood. Yeah. But um no, it was one office. It was the warehouse to office. There was like 10 employees, maybe. I, I can't even remember how many employees. I was in seventh grade. I would work there in the summer putting together parts in the warehouse. Like my dad was like, You're just you're going to work. And I yeah. said, Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a place though like oh, did you crazy. know did you know it was lightning in a bottle then or was it just no. like it was literally it was like we're wearing it, it it was i remember thinking to myself huh this is really interesting i'm wearing a hat that i think is really cool that represents a cooler company who would have ever thought i'd wear a hat that represents a cooler company you know yeah. it's like yeah. That doesn't make any sense. Nobody's it was wearing like, ice chest gear at this point. Yeah. yeah. It was like nobody had a hat that said Igloo on it or Lifetime or whatever the other products were at the time. Right. But they've created this cult brand and this cult identity that everybody wants to be a part of. And it was really cool. Um, and the, the two founders of Yeti have been unbelievably great to me and gracious to me throughout my kind of career in the beginning of my career. And I actually kind of worked for one of them all through high school, helping with all kinds of different stuff, uh, which was also super, super educational. And I, I, my life literally has just been a natural progression of passion, but also me stumbling into these incredible blessings. And right, right place right, at the right time. Right place, right time. Totally. Yeah. 100%. What's up, everybody? It's Brian. Look, I've got a great episode coming up next week with Hunter Hammonds. We'll be talking all about the insane next chapter for assembly and you don't want to miss it. So hit the subscribe button. And get back to the episode. What does the book of business look like right now? Like who all, who all are you totally. jumping around we, with in Austin right now? So to kind of backtrack a little bit, traveling yeah. with the US team, with doing all this other stuff in high school, made me fall in love with the idea of photography. When I got to school in college, I had certain brands that were sponsoring me just because of the US team and, and traveling and all of them needed content. And it basically came to this point where they were giving me all this free product for content. I was like, this is awesome. I don't have to pay for all this shit anymore. Like, hell yeah. yeah. Like, 
give it to me. <laughs> and then yeah. I got to the point where I was like, all right, I've got too much shit. Like y'all yeah. are sending me all this product. It's awesome. I don't have a use for all of it. I need money now. And yeah. uh, there was this really cool advertising agency in South Carolina that actually ended up being the first person that ever hired me. And they gave me a summer internship uh, my freshman year. And I went and lived in Charleston, South Carolina. And we took a boat from the Keys all the way to Charleston and fly fished the whole way and photographed and filmed the whole thing. And it was kind of like this second eye-opening moment for me where it was like, I can use this little box and press buttons and make a living. Like, yeah. whoa, holy where shit. Did, where did you pick up the the technical know-how? Were you just kind of making it up as you went? YouTube? Yeah, literally YouTube college. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like while I was in college, I, I literally remember being in my freshman dorm room, going to, you know, business classes and all this and being like, oh, this is boring as shit. And then going home and spending like hours and hours and hours watching YouTube videos and learning how this little box worked. Because that, that was it. I was like, this is like when I said, I, I, I'm a super, super addictive person. Uh-huh. And that's why I've always been so thankful. Like, it's just a total God thing that he, he in my mind, he knew that if my identity was drugs and alcohol, I was going to be better at drugs and alcohol than you. Right. <laughs> so, he gave, <laughs> so he gave me fly fishing in the outdoors because he's like, you can never be the best at this. Go chase this forever and ever. There you go. Yeah. And it will keep you alive, hopefully. <laughs> and it will keep you, yeah. Well, I mean, like you would think so, except that these are not the safest environments that you're, you're hanging <laughs> off boats and like yeah. you're, you're in the back of, on the back of snowmobiles and snow cats and stuff, you know, it's like, Oh, it, totally. If when I say it, adventure photographer, that's the best way to describe it. Like you have, I don't know, what are the, what are the brand deals like? Like, what do they, what do they know of you and say, like, you know, you've got to come take this for us. Like what, what do they see or what do they want you to go do? Great question. Honestly, one of the pitches that I had for the longest time to work with brands was there's so, so many great photographers and content creators and creators out there Mm -hmm. um, that can tell a story really well. My value add to the fly fishing world, which is kind of where I started was, hey, I know how to do this really good on the other side of the camera. And I also know how to do it really good on this side of the camera so I can tell the story accurately to portray your brand to whereas we could bring, you know, anybody else in here, somebody that works for any other brand that knows how to use the camera, but they may not know how to tell this fly fishing story and show this product accurately and correctly, which was always kind of my leg up. Like brands in the outdoor industry would hire me because I could speak the language correctly that they're trying to portray to their audience. That is so wise to say that because i think back so when we would do brand photography and i would i would go through things with you you'd be like we can't use that one You're like that's a great shot why not and you would say like boots are wrong or he's holding the shot he's not holding the shotgun right or that's not how that's not how you you know you you would point out these little details about the authenticity of the shot you like anybody who knows their who's worth their weight like they know that that's not right and so if we're if you're trying to appeal to these enthusiasts, these people that really know what they're talking about, then all those details matter. And so often you would show me an ad or you'd pull something up, and you'd be like, I don't want to buy from them or I don't trust them or they're not right because of whatever it was, whatever the saddle is on the horse or, or however he's totally. like, however the horse is behaving or did, all these little details that you would notice. Like how, where did you pick up all that stuff? Man, it's I, details matter, I think is is kind of the, the premise of what we're both saying and like you've seen it founders are picky as shit about Mm -hmm. what they want their brand to be and it's it's their heart right like it's the product they've either created or funded and that brand that is the the selling point and the the catalyst to moving product is their heart and it's like uh i guess the best way to say it would be it's real it's it's vulnerable for them and they want somebody that they can trust that understands how they think and understands the brand that they want to represent because it's it's hard for a lot of these founders to say hey they can say hey i want yeti great yeti costs a shitload of money and a ton of effort and tens like a de- couple decades you know yeah. it's like yeah that's awesome let's let's start here first by yeah. being honest true identifying who we are what's our purpose why are we doing this i think it really just comes down to the fact that details matter and that these brands want to make sure that if they're selling a premium product in the fly fishing space, in the outdoor space, in the whatever space outside that the people that are buying their product, yes, there's going to be people that buy their product that may not see the the fly line is tied on wrong or whatever, but 
the the fly fishing guide that you want bought in that could be your best salesman even if he's unpaid just just to be a validator for you needs to see that it's well thought through and it's created well with intention and there's somebody sitting there going okay that's good shit that's good shit what what is the relationship like how do you nurture those relationships i guess like where, where, how how are you meeting these people and then like how are you relating to them on a way that they want to hire you for these these big gigs I, for me it's always been sales has kind of taken a backseat it's just been be as nice and helpful as possible in the short term mm -hmm. and if good things are supposed to happen good things will happen uh just like the biggest thing in this world, I think in, in every single endeavor people take business wise is like your reputation. And I've been in this industry since I was literally 14. So yeah. I have fucked some stuff up. Like there's some people that are like, <laughs> Knox is yeah. an idiot. You know, it's like, that's okay. <laughs> they're, they're right. Not, they're right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're totally, they are fully validated yeah. in their opinions. Like, yeah. It, yeah, have I have totally messed some shit up. But the goal ultimately has always been treat my clients well, treat the people who work with me as best as I can and, and be more helpful than I am getting paid to be doing. Like that's like over, over deliver under promise is under kind promise of the, the goal. Deliver. Yeah. I feel like that's, that's the wild thing is cause I don't know if there's anybody you don't know. I mean, it would be like, Oh, we need to put on a dove hunt. Oh, I, like there's this ranch out in West Texas, but there's also this other ranch. If y'all really want to go crazy or what we could do, we could like, if y'all want, if y'all want to go international, it's like, it, it's weird. The connections that you've been able to make, but none of them seem very strained. It's like, maybe that's, that's why people are so like comfortable around you and relate to you is because you're not approaching it in like tactically, like you need to sell them something, but that you're really just putting the relationship first. I appreciate you saying that. And I've tried really hard not to be tactical about it. There's definitely some approach to where in my mind, I'm like, hey, I want to work with these people in the long term, you know, what do I have to do to get there in the future. But I think, ultimately, what it comes down to is Mother Nature is the greatest equalizer, it doesn't care if you have a billion dollars or $1. Um, and then when you share an experience outside hunting, fishing, camping, surfing, rock climbing, whatever it is, you yeah. tend to have I don't know if it's a chemical bond, but a bond that's much deeper than if you and I were just to do a phone call, right? Yeah. Um, so those relationships that I have with all these people have been curated through outdoor experience. Experience, yeah. Which comes and creates really natural. Well, that yeah, anybody growth. that's ever been on a hunting trip knows that there's like there's a bond with the people that you you oh, go 100%. with yeah. that is way different than that. Like you get to be really close really quick whenever you you go out and, and do one of these big hunts or, or a big fishing trip. And you said, I mean, you do things like you just said, like go from the keys to, to Charleston, South Carolina, like you're on a boat with somebody for a little while and, or for a couple of days and like y'all are best buddies, whether you mean to or not. A hundred percent. Yeah. Or worse enemies. Like it's, that's the cool thing. Like <laughs> it, it, there's, you can't, there's certain things where people can hide and put up a facade but when you go hunt in Alaska for 12 days straight, like if the client doesn't like you, they're definitely not going to like you at the end. And like, nobody wants to spend time with a dickhead for 12 days. I was like, going to say, how do you, how do you manage those situations where you go out and like, you know, you've got it, you're stuck in a blind or something with, with just like awkward people, you know, like how, oh, how dude, <laughs> it gets so awkward. Yeah. It gets so awkward. But I mean, you just got to love, like, I think it comes back to, I'm super lucky to love what I do. And yeah. I really, really just love being outside as is. Mm -hmm. So even if there may not be the best person, which is so rare, but even if it's not the best person, it's like, I'm just happy to be out here. And most of the time, the locations that I'm getting to shoot in are incredibly beautiful. And if you're going to be unhappy in Mexico when you're fishing in crystal clear water, like screw off, dude, like look, open your eyes. Look how beautiful this is. So I mean, it, you really do keep like the passion part of it, the passion, but like the, you know, getting to be outside and going on these trips, like that's what fostered this love for photography. And you figured mm -hmm. out how to parlay that into daily work that is super fulfilling and fun and challenging every day. What are, what are some of the brands that you've worked with? Just so I, I, I know, oh, man. I know Yeti and I know it, I always, I always mess up the name of this bio. Oh, Bahio. Yeah. Bahio, the sunglasses. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, Yeti, uh, but Bahio kind of pulled me Bahio. out of a sweet, awesome funk. Like they were the only brand that was willing to travel and do shit during COVID. And oh, I was one of the oh, only okay. photographers that was like, yeah, I'll go to Mexico. Let's do it. 
Yeah, sure. If <laughs> yeah. you need me to wear a mask on the plane, cool. Like, let's go. Yeah. Um, no, I, I mean, there's all kinds of brands. Yeti, Bahio, Howler Brothers. All, uh, let's oh, yeah, Howler. Yeah, that's right. Um, sea Home Watches, Pecos Outdoor, Poncho Outdoor. Blah, blah. It's a bunch of different outdoor brands yeah, that we've you, you've fallen worked into with the sweet the spot. Like, if you're opening up an outdoor brand in Austin, yeah, like if they don't know you already, somebody almost always refers you. Like, you you fall into these situations that are just so so cool. Do you work with the Turtle Box guys too? I've got the, we've I've done got a ton of work over. with them. Yeah, 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 they're they're fantastic guys. It's it's interesting. I like to say I'm geographically blessed, um, and I think Yeti kind of started it to where they made Austin and specifically Texas kind of like this mecca for outdoor brands. I mean, there's ten or twelve brands that I can name off the top of my head that are based in Texas now, um, where 15 years ago that wasn't really a thing. Uh, and it's it's been really cool for me to get to work with a lot of these guys. The Turtle Box guys are fantastic. Sims people are fantastic. Costa was fantastic. Like, there's so many of these awesome brands. Um, that we've gotten to do work with and travel for. And it's, it's just really cool. Well, I was going to ask you because you like, like Yeti is a good example. You kind of there for like the R and D of that. Like, do you ever get to provide feedback? Do you ever get to work with the founding teams and stuff like that to like perfect the products? At Yeti, I was too young, but at a lot of these other brands we work with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, That that's always kind of been my pitch, Brian is like, Hey, the brand you want to create is the lifestyle I live every day. Mm -hmm. Give me your product to either give you feedback or go create content for you of your product in its natural habitat. Because I've tried to unapologetically live this life of chasing this outdoor love of mine. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just been really awesome. Like for in college, we started this production company with a buddy of mine, Luke. um, And it was truly, I never had these like huge monetary goals with it. It was always just, this is my avenue to see the world before Mm -hmm. I have real responsibility as an adult. And I, I, junior senior year and then the two years after school like i was out of i was out of the country eight months a year bopping around the world with a camera in hand not making money that i could sit here and brag to you about but it's like who cares about the money i'm getting paid to go to the coolest places on the planet like there's so many kids that are trying to get into this outdoor not outdoor but content creation world that uh i meet with all the time and they're always like hey how much do you charge how do you charge and i'm like hey look i'll tell you and i'll be super honest with you Mm -hmm. i don't give a shit like if you come take my client, heck yeah, good for you. It means you're doing better work than me. That's capitalism. Like that's right. awesome. And I'm <laughs> I love super that attitude, man. That's nuts. Yeah, yeah but I'm super honest <laughs> with him because like nobody was ever honest with me getting into this. I just had to stumble forward. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm like, if if money is your goal, this isn't necessarily the best industry to be in. But if you want experience and to meet really amazing people and then build opportunity from there, that's the best way to do it. It's a fantastic way. Um, because there is money in this creative content creation world. You just have to figure out the avenues through trial and error that are best suited for your skill sets to actually go make a difference and make an impact at a company. And there's not and, a found there's not a founder in the world that wants to part with their money, especially to somebody who is like who's not all in. You know, I, 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 every single founder that I work with, they're most impressed by that. I'm going to over deliver work ethic. It's not always about the product, but it's about actually the, their experience working with you, right? It's energy, attitude, and respect. Like if you have those three things in abundance, you will get more clients, even if your work isn't the best, because these founders and these marketing directors want to work with people that they enjoy talking to. Like if I'm going to create a whole ad campaign or all this, do this giant shoot for you and go live in Belize and we're going to make a film for 60 days, like, you don't want the person doing that to be someone you don't enjoy talking to, especially in the post-processing process, because mm. that sucks. Yeah. Like it's no yeah. fun. You're like, shit, man. Yeah. So you're still, you'll, you'll do the photography, but you're also putting together these big stories too, right? Like you, you like the big Yeti present style content, like that's your bread we, and butter. We've done it. Yeah. And it's, it's been awesome. There's not that many clients that need it anymore because it doesn't move the needle as much for people anymore. It's just hard to get eyeballs that we've found. Mm -hmm. I mean, meta and everything is just pushing so much UGC and vertical iPhone video. And like, it's really funny. You do this $20,000 shoot, you know, and you have the 50, 60, $70,000 worth of camera gear and you get there. And then the client's like, Hey, uh, by the way, do you think, um, maybe sort of kind of like you could get some iPhone footage? I was going to ask about that. Like where, (laughs) how have y'all adapted to like, um, like the short form world? I mean, what's your approach to that? To be totally honest, my approach has been to back away from the production world. Um, 
and figure out other ways to provide value for clients in um and social media management, email, all, all, all these kind of different realms, more of like a marketing business way to do it. Uh, I think there's still a ton of value add. I think the biggest way we provide value now is having these young guys that work for us that can go get you the stuff you need. And it's not this crazy high end level because really all it is, is every brand needs content. Every brand needs more and more and more and more and more content every day. Mm -hmm. And it needs to get cheaper, man. And it's literally it, like I tell people all the time, because there's all these photographers and content creators that are old school that are getting pissed off at the younger generation for doing it cheaper. And mm -hmm. maybe it's worse, but it's like, that's capitalism, man. Yeah. Like if you're not willing to either go cheaper and faster, it's like, I hope you have a clientele base that's wanting to spend more money because it's just getting cheaper across the board and having to figure out how to do that. Hopefully one day it comes back and it's like, we want this high end content again, but it's definitely uh, in a different world than well, it was. Well, speaking of the high end stuff, I think that that's what I'm super excited to talk to you about is that you've like, over the last year, you've really been making this transition into a more artistic approach. Like I said, my life has been a natural progression and passion. Mm -hmm. And I, I try and take really introspective looks into what makes me happy. For a very mm -hmm. long time, traveling and seeing the world was the most fulfilling thing ever and creating content was the way to do it. And it got to the point where the travel was really awesome, but the content creation wasn't scratching a creative itch for me. And I did some really deep dives in myself and was like, what, what makes me happy in, is there a business within that, that I can do it to where it's like a one, two punch. It makes me super happy and it makes me money. Right. Cause yeah. like at the end of the day, money is a necessary evil. We got to figure out ways to make money. Gotcha. Like that's why we're all doing it. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's necessary. The goal is hopefully you do something that makes you really happy and it makes you money. Uh, and the natural evolution of that was fine art photography. There's yeah. a few different photographers. There's this guy named Sebastio Salgado, who's this Brazilian guy who's created some of the most incredible, iconic black and white imagery of all time. There's another photographer, Nick Brandt, who's another black and white, incredible photographer. And then there's a, a photographer, David Yarrow. And these guys are selling their photos anywhere from ten to a hundred thousand dollars a piece i'm looking at these photos i'm going holy shit like maybe i can't create as good as they can but like i can create some stuff that tells a story like these images yeah. uh and that's and you, kind and of you can get to some places that can capture them you can build exactly. those relationships yeah oh yeah 100 percent. well it's it's all about relationships and it's all about creating an image that tells a story that what i always tell my collectors is it's really really easy to create a photo that's cool there's 8 yeah. billion photographers in the world now because everybody who has a phone is a photographer. It's really, really hard to tell a photo or create a photo that tells a story that mm -hmm. pulls at your heartstrings, right? Because the whole reason people buy art, I think there's there's three to four reasons. The first is it's like it's it's provocative. You like to look at it, right? Mm -hmm. Like something about it makes your eyes go, whoa. Yeah. The second is the brand of the artist. And then the third is the story. The story is in in my opinion, the most important, the most powerful, the most powerful, nobody buys anything they don't necessarily need without wanting knowing the story or wanting to be a part of it, right? A brand and story kind of go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, since I have this production background, I'm trying to create these pieces that have the story element built in so that they build my brand in turn. Well, we're going to try and show some of this stuff for anybody. Oh, yeah, else. But, but before you do, I want you to tell the first story you ever told me, I want you to, to recount for me. Um, please. Might have been like the first time that I met you and you had just kind of run into this guy and the resulting <laughs> photo will, uh, I, I'm not going to tell, we'll, we'll show it in just a second, but this is the, this is the, um, the bridge photo that you took. Yep, the, the yeah. Yeah. Talk to me about the, like, the actual story of how that came to be. So my goal within this is to create real relationships. That is mm -hmm. the end all be all goal, whether it's the collector or the people within the photos. And that's always been my goal. And so I was walking on South Congress, which if anybody's been to Austin, they've been on South Congress and it's this big tourist area and a really, a now really good buddy of mine rides his horse up and down South Congress and lets people jump on and take photos and charges the money. And that's kind of like how he makes a living. Okay. And I saw him and I thought he was this cowboy. I was like, holy cow, look at this guy. He's a freaking cowboy. Like, yeah. I want to go talk to him. Maybe I could do this photo. And I literally like had this photo idea with him like right then. I was like, oh, this is going to be awesome. And it's going to tell the Austin story and it's going to be really cool. 
and he's going to love it. And I went up to this guy and I, I was like, hey, man, I've got this idea. I think it's going to be awesome. I like hit him with this like crazy amount of energy that he was not prepared for. And he was like, okay. no, fuck off. Like, get out of here. <laughs> Literally, he was like, get out of here, man. Get out like, of here, kid. Do you no. want to ride or not? <laughs> yeah. Like, that, that was it. He's like, we're not, we're not doing that. No, yeah. it was a stupid idea. Um, and so I, I'm not very good at taking no for an answer when I want to do something. Like, mm -hmm. when I want to make something happen, I no is just a speed bump, you know? And, uh, and so I, I figured out who knew this guy. I started getting in contact with him. He continued to tell me he's so it, it ends up he's an Apache Native American guy. So he's an American Indian and he's this really, really awesome guy. He's a super spiritual guy. And American Indians have this weird deal with photography um, to where it's kind of a cultural belief of theirs in, in certain tribes to where the photo kind of captures your soul and takes captures away your soul. OK, I'd heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, it's kind of this interesting thing to where it's hard. They don't want to take they don't want anybody taking a photo of them that doesn't understand respect and basically want to help build what they they believe like the goal right. is mutual benefit yeah. um most most of the time they've been photographed in history there's been very little mutual benefit so they right. have yeah. they have this distrust which is very understanding um you. yeah. Do you're so, basically documenting legacy and you better understand and respect that legacy or else you you're not going to get the privilege you're not going to get the privilege to do it and um i think working with him has been a wildly awesome lesson but long story short he told me no 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 he and i i finally figure out where he lives i show up at his house we, we spend like six hours having like a eye-to-eye -eye conversation he's like holy shit you're not you're you're dead serious about this yeah. this means this way more to legit. you yeah yeah he's like this means way more to you than i thought it did let's go he said let's think about creating this image and he goes, I'm a medicine man for my tribe. I lead sweat lodges at my house every Wednesday night. I want you to come do this sweat lodge with me so I know your intentions are pure and true. And only then will I say yes or no to doing the photo. I said, awesome. I'm in. Tell me when. And so I show up at his house. It's 107 degrees outside of the teepee. Okay. It and, also, a, yeah. and a sweat lodge is basically Native American church is kind of the easiest way to explain it. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea is the teepee is mother nature's womb. You crawl in and when you come back out, you're reborn into the world. It takes about three hours. There's four rounds. It's fantastically difficult and awesome. Um, mm -hmm. And so I come in with zero. I, I was like, I'm going to do zero research on this. I was about to say, did, gonna, did you like eat, prep, drink water? No, like were you I, ready? I did, <laughs> I did drink a shitload of water because he okay. told me, he's like, just make sure you drink a bunch of water. And, uh, <laughs> But other than that, I, I knew very little what to expect because I wanted the I wanted the experience to be like fully present. Yeah. Like I was like, I'm just gonna succumb to this experience. And so the way it happens is they take these lava rocks that come from the volcano outside of Austin and they heat them up in a fire all day long. And then each round they put different rocks into the fire pit. And they frick, that mother sucker gets hot, <laughs> man. So like like easily over 150 degrees, approaching 200, right? If it's not, I would, uh, and I would, like what, I would, what's I, the difference between 150 and 200 is hot. <laughs> it's hot. It's, yeah. it's, it's really hot. I have no idea what the technical temperature is. I'll tell you, I do a, a sauna now, like weekly, like a sauna at like 190 and it feels like nothing compared to it. Oh wow! But the problem is there. So they, the, the, the rocks come in and you're in this teepee, the teepee door closes and it's pitch black. And then they take some sagebrush and some cedar and other stuff and they burn it on there. And that's what, that's what begins the prayer. And then everybody starts chanting and singing and praying together. And it's really cool because the guy said, we don't hold the hostages here. If you need to leave the teepee, just leave when we're not praying because there's breaks in between each round. Mm -hmm. And then pray to whatever God you believe in. This is our way to connect with our God. Mm -hmm. And they pour water onto the, the rocks so there's steam everywhere. And obviously the heat rises. In each round... It's hard to say how long they last because it's really, really difficult. You start um, to you start to like hallucinate almost. I mean, you're you're totally. you're separating like, from space and time in this. Yeah, pitch black, first, super hot, yeah, chanting yeah. like it's yeah. everything that you need to hallucinate. It's all it's I, all the things. It, it's all there. Yeah, everything's there. Yeah. And you like you can't see your hot hand in front of your face like that. And uh, the first round, I was like, holy shit, I'm gonna melt and die on this TP floor for sure. And you knew you had three more after that too. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. And in my head, I was like, no matter what happens, 
even if they have to pull my melted body off, I am making it through this because I, I have to create this photo. Yeah. I was like, I have to create it. And 150% passion. That's it. Dude. Yeah. That's it, dude. And so after that first round, we're sitting there going around, um, they open the teepee door. They let a little bit of air in so you can breathe a little bit, which is the greatest feeling in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, 100, the guy, 105 degrees outside feels great all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And Samuel uh, looks at me and he goes, hey, think with your heart and not your mind. Your mind is weak and your heart is strong. The only way to make it through this is if you think with your heart. Like put all your intention and all your energy to your heart because your mind will tell you you're gonna, you can't make it, but I promise you, you can't. Yeah. And I was like, whoa. And so the other really cool thing about these sweat lodges is the goal is to come in with really intentional purpose, whether you mm -hmm. want to heal somebody, whether you want to pray for somebody, be thankful, whatever it is, come in with intention and pray that intention the whole time. Mm -hmm. And so for me, my intention was, I want to pray and be the most grateful person in this teepee and in Austin. Like I have been incredibly blessed my entire life. I just want to resoundingly, I guess, just like throw gratitude you wanna, everywhere. You want to embrace it. Yeah. You yeah, want just to be, it, you want to become gratitude. That's it. Yeah. And that, like, literally, I just wanted to be like, as grateful as I could be. And I was just like, thanking God and thanking God and thanking God. And thank that was it for like the three hours that we were in there. And towards the end of the third, fourth round, where it's like, I've kind of filled my heart with gratitude, like I can take it a little bit better. I have these like beautiful visions. And it's awesome. And it's so beautiful and like crystal clear and real. And then I'm singing along with these Apache songs that I've never heard before knowing the words like it was the craziest the words experience. came to you. Oh, dude, it was just like, oh, uh, you know, like going with it. Yeah, it was you awesome. Knew it. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. it was, it was so cool. Um, and so we come out of the teepee, and you're not allowed to walk ever in the teepee because the teepee is Mother Nature's womb. So you have to crawl. And when you crawl back out, the idea is you're born, you're reborn into the world every time mm -hmm. you do it. And we walk around the circle, and you thank every single person that was in it. And then we finally get to the end, and Sam comes out last, and he comes up to me, and he pulls me aside, and he goes, "All right, your intentions are true. Let's go create this book. Let's go." Yeah. And so oh that my was, gosh. In, in, in honor of him, we titled the photo gray horse, which is his last name. And, uh, it's, it's well, one show, of my favorite. Show photos. me yeah. now, 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 now you've got to show it. Absolutely. Um, All right, if you, if you're just listening, flip your phone around because there's a video on YouTube or Spotify or wherever else you can see this thing. Knox is about to pull up his website and show us gray horse. Cause it is insane. All right. So here's the photo titled gray horse and you can see, can you see this, Brian? Yeah, I can. This is on your this is on your website. Yep, this is on the website. Knoxcronenberg.com. So yes, sir. So this is the photo of Sam Greyhorse. Um, he's sitting in full war paint with Austin skyline in the background. And I don't know if you can see, but he's got the capital here between his legs. And everybody always asks, like, how did you create this photo? Yeah. Um, and, and we did it at 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning. So, so this is on South Congress. Did you shut the street down? We actually didn't shut the street down because in Austin, they're super liberal and you can technically in Texas ride a horse on any road under 60 mile an hour speed limit. So we just rode them out there and asked for forgiveness. The police drove by and were like, hell yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> how, did, how was there nobody on it though? There's no, no runners, no traffic, no nothing. Why did y'all, how did y'all get around the traffic? It was 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning. There was just nobody out. We were just really lucky in the summer. Everybody's sleepy in the summer. And he's like, he's in traditional uh apache where he's got like the war paint on with his horse yep yep, yep. and so it took me it's and he still hasn't given me what all of the symbols mean um but i do know that the hands on the horses mean uh for every hand that means that's a kill and hand-to-hand -hand combat in the past which is pretty crazy authentic um, like did i mean did he no did he shoot? i don't think he, okay. i don't think he's okay. killed anybody. Okay. <laughs> But who knows? <laughs> well, you you put this uh, you put this Texas traffic thing to the test as well, right? Because you I, oh yeah, you called me. I called you one time for like some random something, and you're like, can't talk right now. I'm on the side of the road in Dallas. We're trying to shut this bridge down. I got the cops out here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, literally. So so that photo is actually this one right here. It's called a Texan commute. Dallas is a little bit. Um, the black and white is insane too. Like, thank you so I've, much, I've got man. To, like just the whole like. You've figured out a way to to do black and white with so much depth and richness. It's amazing. Well, the goal for me has always been how do I build as much depth into an image? And I think that color sounds like it's awesome, but it's ultimately really limiting. Co the, the ability with black and white has to put you in this timeless sense to kind of 
allow the viewer and the collector to put themselves at any level in time is I think really, really fascinating because you could sit here and look at a black and white image and go, Oh man, that's a hundred years ago. Or that was yesterday. There's not, yeah. there's no limit on the time constraint. Whereas color on the digital side of things is it, it really can limit you um, in my mind. Totally. Well, it's, um, it's, it's definitely one of those things that you, you've got to know what you're doing. I mean, you, a lot of people can take a black and white photograph. Like you, you flip around your iPhone, you put the filter on, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm artistic. But like, it's so hard to do it right. Like when you look at a properly shot, properly exposed, properly developed black and white image, it's like, I can even look at this on a computer screen and you just, there's so much depth to this photo. There's so much rich, richness in the contrast. Like, I, I don't know. It. I don't know how you're getting shots like this while <laughs> like, you know, I, I think if I remember right, like the cops had not been helpful. And then all of a sudden they said it was cool. And they, but they were going to block off the road at like the worst possible time. And the horse was spooked. like, there was all these things going on and you still got to get the <laughs> shot. Right. So, so basically the way the story goes was we had 48 hours to get this photo. I drove up the day before. So now it's down to 12 hours to get the photo. The guy who has the horse is the trainer of the horse needs to leave at like 11 AM that day on an airline out of Dallas. So we have, basically we had a window from 5 AM to 7 AM to get this photo done. Yeah. And of that time, there's only about 30 minutes of the right light that we can do it within. Oh yeah. Right? Cause you were limited by light time of day and everything. I, I yeah. don't even think about that. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to have the right light. So this is literally the first light of the day coming up, hitting the, like the skyline, hitting the guy on horseback, like that light hitting his face is the first rays of sunshine of that day, which is important because that's the best light for me, even if it's black and white, it still gives me the most depth to edit within mm -hmm. and create in detail. And it's also soft enough to where nothing is blown out and too harsh. You're not um, showing, you're not showing up with light kits and like, no, no, you know, crews and things like that. Like you're literally just like, let's go get this shot. Yeah. And yeah. 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 No. And so <laughs> long story short, I called every single person I knew in Dallas trying to see if anybody knew a cop because Dallas was saying that in order for me to do this, I needed a permit not because I was riding the horse. They're like, we don't care if you ride the horse on that bridge, but because you're filming it, you have to have a permit. Okay. Long well, story short, priorities, I, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Long story short, the permit process takes three weeks and I didn't get a permit. So I'm calling all these people hoping I can find a cop that's friendly that wants to come help me. Just close it down for 20 minutes. Yeah. I'm going cop to cop knocking on their windows, Brian, saying, hey, I've got this crazy idea. Please... <laughs> please come help me. And they're like, dude, you're fucking crazy. Like, how no. did you find somebody that was down? Like what? <laughs> who said they would come help? Total blessing, total God thing. I canceled the photo shoot at 5 PM the night before uh -huh. I said, Hey guys, I haven't been able to find anybody to help me close the bridge down. We cannot do this without the bridge closing down. Cause if the horse freaks out, if a car drives by and throws the rider or throws the horse over the bridge, they're dead. I'm sued. My right. business is over. This is downtown Dallas. <laughs> this is downtown Dallas, like middle of downtown. And uh, so a really good buddy of mine circling all the way back to how whole, this whole world we're living in is all interconnected, owns the fly shop in, Austin, in Dallas. Okay. And he was like, hey, man, there's a freaking fireman that comes in here. And I've already told him about the idea. I don't think he can do it, but he's super nice. Here's his number. Maybe you can. And so I call him. And the guy's like, dude, Knox, it's such a cool idea. But I can't close that bridge down, man. It's just too big of a bridge. Like, no, no freaking way. And I'm like, no, man, it's this little bridge right next to it. All I need is 20 minutes. That's it. Yeah. And he's like, there's like a pause on the phone. And, you know, it's like kind of like that suspenseful moment in a movie where he's like, and he just goes, fuck it, I'll see you at 6 a.m. You got 20 minutes. You got 20 minutes. <laughs> Look at yeah. that. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. So literally... And, and then the next morning, though, it's I show up at five, horses show up at 545. It's not light until like 651, I think, if I remember correct. So we're sitting there for an hour in the dark. Fireman's not there. It's 630. Fireman's not there. Lights in 20 minutes. We got all the horses, everything ready. We're like, holy shit. Like what if, is he, what if he, is he gonna come? Yeah, what yeah. if he doesn't show up? Like he said he would, but what if he doesn't? Like we've already, we're already here. 640. Holy shit. 645. He rolls up. He's like, I'm so sorry. There was a fire last night. I've been on the call. We're like, holy <laughs> shit, man. No worries. Yeah. 
Yeah, he's Sorry, like, that, oh. was an, that was an actual yeah. fire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, I almost didn't come. And then he whips the fire truck around, throws out a bunch of cones, closes the two lanes. We ride the horse out, rear him up five or six times. They're like, did you get the photo? And I'm like, I think so. I hope so. And he's like, good. We got to get the hell out of here. And we load the horse trailer and we roll. I can't believe that, man. Show me. Yeah. Show, do you, what about some of the new stuff? Yeah. You, so uh, all can, this, can you show any of that? So the new stuff I'm working on is, is a whole new series. Um, it's basically, I want to take these uh, iconic landscapes that everybody knows and create unique imagery in front of them that may have happened 200 to 10,000 years ago is kind of the idea. Yeah. Just um, lost in time kind of a thing. Like you don't know, yeah. you don't know when this could be. Totally. And so this first one is, this is in front of uh, a mountain called Mount Sopris in Aspen. Whoa, and so, dude. And you're on this mountain, Like right? This is not, there's no green screen. This is, there's no bullshit around this. Yeah. There's no green screen. And so this is an old trapper coming out with his wolf pelt and his elk antlers and his ax. He's coming out of the mountains down into the valley to come trade, right? With whoever. And then that's Mount Sopris in the background, which is the second most photographed mountain in Colorado behind Maroon Bells. Mm -hmm. um, and is this really, really awesome location. That shoot could not have been more chaos. Every idea I had, I had rented three snowcats. I had a forest service permit. I had all of this stuff lined up to go shoot in front of Maroon Bells, but it snowed 20 inches a day before day we got I was going to say there's so much fresh powder. Yeah, yeah. We couldn't do it. For three days, we stayed in Aspen hoping that we could see enough light to see these the mountain tips. So there was, I, I was going to ask you about that too, because the, like snow screws up all your light, right? Because it's reflecting totally. everything. Doesn't yep. matter if like you've got perfect conditions, like everything's blown out. Right. Well, so yes and no. And I actually kind of like it. I like there's some images that are completely blown out besides the main character, which is kind of fun because it simplifies it. But what made it really difficult is the clouds were so low that whole four days that we were there that we couldn't see this mountain for four days. There was 15 minutes of enough light to get that shot. Like we had 15 minutes and four day window that we just oh, all happened gosh. to be ready for. Like it like was the, it was awesome. the adrenaline, like the frustration has to set in and like the adrenaline has to set in when oh. it's about to be right. And then it's just constant up and downs, right? It's crazy because it literally happened in the sense that like if, if the film comes out when we finish it correctly, it's like first day we got some okay stuff. Second day we got some okay stuff. Third day we got some okay stuff. Fourth day, final day of shooting, we go to the bells. It doesn't work. We try and shoot in front of what's called Pyramid Peak. It doesn't work. We go and shoot in Aspen at this place called Kimosabi. We get some fairly cool stuff there. And then we go and try and shoot in these Aspen trees up the valley, but the snow's seven feet deep and we can't get the horses in there. So it's like in that one day, we had three shots that we tried to get that all failed. Mm. And I'm like, oh my God, like these aren't cheap days, by the way. Like I've got right. a full on production crew there. I've got cowboys, I've got horses, I've got people helping. Like, Every day that I don't get a shot is it's just a freaking big chunk money. of money. Just yeah. burning. It's like literally light it on fire, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> and so we go back to this ranch where we've been set up the whole time. And we're like, man, the clouds look like they're kind of breaking. Maybe this afternoon we'll see it. This is the last afternoon of shooting. Like if it doesn't happen now, it doesn't happen at all. And we get everybody set up and we're like, I was like, look, guys, let's just ride into the field anyways just on the hope and a prayer. I want to make sure we're ready just in case we get that smidge of light and go time. Yeah. And it was an hour to sunset. So it's like an hour and we don't have any light to shoot. Mm -hmm. 30 minutes, we don't have any light to shoot. And then it was like, boom, there's the peaks with the perfect light. Ride your horses right here. <laughs> shoot a shit ton. And happened. we got it. Yeah. Yeah, it was amazing. Unreal. This whole series is insane. Yeah, so this is a whole nother, this is kind of in my Echoes oh, of the West series. I need to be um, able to blow this up more. Hold on just a second. Can I make yeah. this bigger on my screen? The I detail don't... in here is insane. Oh, the detail is unbelievable. This yeah. like a poker game? Yeah, and so the idea is I have this whole series called Echoes of the West, and I want to create this thought-provoking thought -provoking imagery that makes you think about like what could have happened in the West, right? And like the West is this wild, wild West, and it's this mythical place where lawlessness and cowboys and Indians and all this stuff clashes. And I wanted to create a photo that kind of tied into um, that old scene, but also kind of like in the newer world, if you see all these, you know, you got all these lights and Bud Light, Budweiser and all that, it's in a newer bar, but it kind of plays into the fact that 
there's always like the, to me the theme of this photo is there's always a bullshitter at the table there you go <laughs> like if you don't know who it is it's probably you and I love that none of the Cowboys are looking at the the bullshitter because they're like, I got to focus right here if I'm going to win this game. Yeah. And they then you got the long, yeah. yeah. And you got the Longhorn with his cards. Um, and all of these characters are such interesting. How did you people. get the bull to behave? It looks like the bull is posing. So I don't know. The, so the gentleman right here behind him, mm -hmm. and then the gentleman to his right, if you're looking at the photo, those those guys are brothers. It's Mo and Joe, and Mo and Joe own the Longhorn, and his name is Ben. And he's gentle as can be. Gentle Ben. And gentle Ben, we wrote him in. Of course, he poops everywhere in the bar. Inside the bar. <laughs> yeah. Literally the first two seconds he's in the bar, he stops and poops. And we're all like, oh. <laughs> Just balls one up. <laughs> yeah. And, and the funny thing is, Brian, like I have these ideas and I'm like, man, how hard is it going to be to really bring a Longhorn into a bar? Like, let's do it. When that Longhorn walked into the bar, my first thought was, holy shit, this is real life. Like he's huge. <laughs> yeah. Monster animal inside yeah. of very confined space. You oh, suddenly just, smell him. You suddenly sense him. You suddenly feel yeah. him. You, like it's, it is a monster. Yeah. And I guess one of the things that we haven't talked about with all this art is I sell it really, really big. So the smallest size I sell anything at is 70 inches and the largest yeah. is a hundred plus. So this photo is really neat. And then depending on what kind of format you're looking on it, it on your phone or on your computer, whatever it is, right? Like it's cool. But when you see it a hundred inches long, it is amazing. Like there's so much depth to it, whether it's the guy in the background smoking a cigarette, all of yeah. their eyes, the cards, the table, the guns, the money on the table, like the pool playing in the background, the musician, like there's so much depth that you can literally look at this photo for two hours and always find something. And, and you capture it. That's, that's the insane thing. And I love the site too. I got to, uh, I got to shout out, um, oh, Matt hell yeah. at, at leverage for, um, I mean, they just did an insane job with your website. Oh, can you I, pull I, that I, up? Can you pull that up again? So everybody can see it. We got to show that thing off. I think they won a bunch of awards for it too, which is awesome. Um, so the website, it's just beautiful, man. You got this endless scroll kind of showing you, a bunch of the different photos we've done. Um, and they all, when you hover over them, they tell you the title, The Last Stand. You got Serengeti King here. And then you get to come over. And one of the big things is um, I like having depth and meaning into everything. So this kind of tells you what each of the series means and what each of the series stands for. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to come over here and click on them, you get to click on Gray Horse. You get to see the photos printed and framed so you can understand what the final product looks like. And then you get to watch this video of me telling you the behind the scenes story yeah. plus, plus the write up plus imagery from the behind the scenes kind of showing you how we created it. It's bringing really in awesome. The, bringing in the story component is insane. And I think that that's the, that's the cool thing that you've talked about, like the, the community aspect, like what you've tried to do with your collectors and like your vision for like the, the people that will invest in your art and, and things you want to, the ways you want to like bridge the gap between the art and the actual people. I think it's so cool, man. The idea is a lot of artists, when the art goes on the collector's wall, that's the end of the relationship. For me, I want that to be the beginning of the relationship. And, uh, and I have these unique abilities through connections around the world from my past experiences and past business endeavors that I have these cool outdoor experiences that we can go do. And the only thing that everybody there will have in common is they're all collectors of my art. So next year I'm taking 10 of my collectors to go heli skiing for two days. And the only, oh, yeah, like the only thing they have in common is going to be that they, that they've bought art from me, which is yeah. fantastic. Bro. I, I love that idea. Like I feel, I feel like, so you think about photography and you mentioned this before, there are a lot of people that can rent a studio and there are totally. a lot of people that can buy the gear and there are a lot of people that can sort of fac facsimilate like a decent image. Like they can create something under the right conditions. Every one of these pieces that you're creating is it's so compelling because it's so like once you understand what it takes to put it together, you realize oh, that it's it's not just like it it's this perfect image captured in chaos. Like there's this That's whole, a, such an awesome way to put it. There's yeah. this whole story around it, and you don't shy away from that component. Like I will tell you the story. I will let you in on the secret. And not only that, like if you're one of, if you're somebody who wants to buy one of my pieces, like you're part of the family, I will take you 
on oh, yeah. one of these adventures. Like the, the next thing that I go, if you want to go, if you want to go make stories of your own, like, let's go, I've got the places and we'll go do it. That's, that's such an experience. Like it's such a, so different from any other piece of art that you're going to buy. I, I, I hope so, man. I, I think that you, you and I talked about this the other day, but in my opinion, well, not in my opinion, in a super crazy smart Charles Koch uh, of Koch Industries, his, he's got this philosophy that the sole reason for business to exist in society is to create value for others. Like my goal within the art is to create value for my collectors. Mm -hmm. I don't want the only value I'm creating for them to be the art piece. I want to find other ways to create value for them that is meaningful and helpful to their lives. That's the whole goal. I love it, man. 150%. That's the goal, baby. We'll That's see how goal. it goes. Yeah, dude, the the art is beautiful. Where can everybody uh, check this out? What I'll yeah, put I'll put the URL up on the screen. Totally. I mean, my so the URL is just going to be knoxcronenberg.com, and then uh, social media is just Knox Cronenberg. They find you on Instagram. Simple. Yep. Yeah, just Knox at Knox Cronenberg. I think is literally my Instagram name. That's it. It'll, it'll all be flashing on the screen right there. And <laughs> and I mean, obviously, Knox is not friendly or fun, so don't seek him out or send him a DM or anything because he's not a nice guy. Uh, <laughs> or if or if you do, you very well could end up like closing down a bridge or up on top of a mountain <laughs> uh, having an adventure yourself. So check out his art. It's insane. It's such a privilege to know you, man. It, it makes me happy every time we get to catch up. And um, I just I really thank you for stopping by taking the time Dude, heck yeah grateful you asked me to be on here man what a cool experience I love catching up and BSing with you it's it's a blast like you're the man I appreciate you happy and looking forward to working together again soon let's do it man well thank you so much for your time I'm gonna let you go here and um bro I'll get over to Austin soon we'll have some fun come on yeah please come on all right buddy. Adios. take care bye everybody all right go ahead and bookmark this episode for the next time you need to get inspired I am grateful for Knox and people like him who bring so much passion and energy to the table in everything that they do. Be sure to check back next week. I'll be talking to Hunter Hammonds about the next chapter of Assembly. You won't want to miss it. So be sure to subscribe to this podcast because it helps me produce more episodes and expand the reach so more people can check it out. In the meantime, thank you so much for listening. I'm Brian Athey, and I'll see you next time.